Welcome to this podcast from Concordia Theological Seminary. I'm Dr. Charles Gieschen, and we are going to be studying the Epistle Lesson for Pentecost 13. That's uh, Series B, which is Ephesians 5, verses 6 to 21. This is a great text speaking about the sanctification or the holy living of Christians, of the church, that results from being baptized into Christ. One of the important themes that we see uh, in this text is the fact that we are to walk as God has called us to walk. It's a wonderful image for Paul. Uh, the image of walking is in contrast to the emphasis of his former Jewish um, life, which was walking according to the law, thinking that that is the key to your righteous status and your acceptance by God. For Paul, sanctification is the result of being justified. This is what we do as the result of already having been declared righteous by the grace of God in Jesus Christ, his saving work for us, not our work to somehow satisfy God's requirement of righteousness. So there's a quite distinct um, difference between how Paul is now preaching holy living versus how he understood it as a, a, a Jew, uh, now as a convert to Christianity, as a Jewish Christian, his understanding of walking in love is, um, is uh, very much grounded in baptism, uh, very much grounded in the fact that Christ is living in him, enabling this new life. The Holy Spirit dwells within him, uniting him with Christ, empowering this new holy life that we're called to live. And so, towards the end of Ephesians, it isn't surprising, as with Paul's other letters, that he talks about the sanctified life. Uh, let's then go to our text where this is uh, laid out for us. And I have some of this visually up on the board by pointing out the fact that one of the big uh, the contrasts to this text is the contrast between darkness and light. And so I did put those in the uh, light blue color. The verbs are in green and uh, the uh, nouns are in yellow. Uh, participles are in purple, uh, and then I highlighted some of the um, some of the uh, uh, the adjectives in red. But I put this in light blue just to show you how often the language of light comes in, and so and then the contrast with darkness too, hiddenness or light. Uh, Here is darkness, which goes with the understanding of hiddenness versus light. So you see that especially in the first <laughs> several verses of our text, that contrast between light and darkness. And that's the difference between the life of being um, in Christ and the life of being in the darkness of our sin. I also think it reflects the fact that pagans would often do some of their cultic activities under the cover of darkness. So Paul picks up on this you know, those, that drunkenness is done under the cover of darkness. You know, it's still present in the world today. Uh, we often do some of those kinds of activities late at night in the, in the cover of darkness. And certainly that's not something new to our 21st century. It's a long time practice, uh, oftentimes uh, uh, of uh, debauchery in the, in, the, in the evenings and in the night. So you see that in our text, that wonderful contrast. We'll look at that as we go through. Let's start off with verse 6 here, where Paul, basically, here's your imperative. You see a lot of imperatives in these final chapters of Paul's epistles. And it's true of Ephesians 2 uh, here. So he says, basically, uh, let no one deceive you. Here's the no one. Here's you. But let no one here. Let allow no, uh, no one to, and here the verb is deceive, you, and with what? Empty words. So there's a big difference between proclaiming the gospel, teaching from the word of God, versus human philosophy, versus the kind of uh, human, uh, sometimes called wisdom, but actually is ignorance. So Paul is saying, don't be led away by these empty words. 
Uh, and uh, obviously that's in contrast to the kind of words he is giving them in this epistle, which are words of life, which are words of substance, because they're reflecting the very teaching of God. And then he goes on and says, uh, Dia Tauta, on account of these things, namely empty words, the kind of human philosophy, human thoughts, that uh, on account of these things, you have the subject at the end here, the wrath of God, hey, orge tu theu, um, is coming. And here it's interesting, it's a present tense, is coming. It's been Romans uh, chapter 1, verses 18, uh, discusses the fact that you have the wrath of God not only as an end time reality, but it's already being manifested against unbelief. The key thing that God's wrath is being um, manifested against is unbelief. He has showered his wrath upon Jesus Christ, our Savior, for all sin. But there's one sin that continues to persist in the world that that uh, elicits God's ongoing wrath, and that's unbelief. And on the last day, there's only one sin that will really be punished, and that's the sin of unbelief, because all other sins have been paid for. But if somebody continues in the sin of unbelief, then they stand unforgiven. So this language of the wrath of God is coming can be understood as, as God continues to show his displeasure against unbelief in the world. And certainly on the last day, we'll see the end time wrath of God against unbelief, uh, which will be um, uh, quite obviously extensive. Is coming, and who is it coming upon? Here you have the epi, plus the, the, so you have the preposition, it's coming upon the sons of disobedience. So the contrast here is obviously between those people who um, have repented and are seeking to live holy lives in obedience to God versus those who are in unbelief and thus are in rebellion against the ways of God. So here they're called the sons of disobedience here. Uh, and uh, that's the language, uh, the title that's given here to those who are unbelievers. Verse 7 uh, continues in this vein, namely the exhortation. Uh, you have, therefore, in light of that statement, uh, he, he emphasizes here, again, another imperative, uh, where you, he says, don't be uh, fellow partakers. You have that sum language, to be fellow partakers of them, you know, with the sons of unbelief. Uh, so often Paul warns against being uh, engaged in, in ongoing fellowship with people who are in rebellion or unbelief against God because it's going to impact our lives. Rather, fellowship, uh, rather uh, be together with those who share um, uh, the faith and trust in Jesus and, and also respecting the ways of the Lord. So here again, that kind of warning to not be uh, it's, we are to be in the world, but not of the world. We are, are in the world with unbelievers, but we are not to be the ones who spend all of our life in their presence and thus get pulled away from uh, our life in Christ and our fellowship with believers, uh, namely with the church. Verse 8, for you were once in darkness. Here again, Paul calls to mind before they were baptized, they were living in the darkness of their sin. And here you have the introduction to that contrast between darkness and light uh, and the understanding that uh, just as Paul himself was blinded and then baptized and, and, and uh, he was given his sight again, in a sense now uh, they have been brought out of the darkness of their sin, the blindness of their sin, and into the light of Christ, the emphasis of Jesus as the light so we are sons of light. So the contrast is once you were in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. This is a very important preposition. Namely, you are light in the Lord because you are in the Lord who is the light of the world. And he has brought his light, his uh, new life into you. So you also are part of the light of the world. 
Jesus himself said that. Let your light, he's the light of the world, but he's brought his light into us. And he said, let your light shine before men so that they may see your good works and praise your Father who is in heaven. So um, uh, the emphasis of being light in the Lord, that's, again, think of the en curio as a baptismal word. We are in the Lord, in Christ. We've been baptized into him. As, and then here's a title, in contrast to being sons of disobedience, we are children of the light. We are children of God, and thus we reflect his light in our lives. So the emphasis there, here the verb comes, walk as children of light, or as children of the light, walk. And I already told you how important that term is. Uh, to transliterate the Hebrew term halak, very important term for Jews is to walk according to the Lord's w ways, and Paul continues to use that as he talks about sanctification, as holy living. It's a walk. Again, a walk not motivated by having to do something to become righteous, but rather as the result of the righteousness we have in Christ already, we are to live or walk this holy life. Verse 9. So uh, you have verse uh, 9 here using the image of fruit, uh, namely the, the contrast here because you are to walk as children of light. He says, for the fruit of the light, fruit of light, you see that language of light again here, fruit of the light um, is... Um, in all goodness, here's again these adjectives, in all goodness and righteousness, there's a term we know as Lutherans very much, and truth. Why? Because the Lord in whom we are is good, and he is righteous, and he is true. So then um, the fruit of being in the light, in the Lord, is this kind of goodness, righteousness, and truth, all in contrast to the kind of disobedience that characterizes the son of, of disobedience. Then verse 10, he continues on. Testing or discerning, this uh, term, dakamazo, here's the participle. Uh, I like to translate it discerning because sometimes testing has a negative connotation that we're testing the Lord. Uh, we are to be discerning uh, in light of the revelation of God, in light of the word of God, discerning, here you have the, um, the interrogative pronoun, discerning what verb is, and then you have this, um, this uh, adjective, what is pleasing to the Lord. Again, as we live out our life, uh, we are to be living it in, with goodness, with righteousness, with truth, because we are discerning in light of the word of God what is pleasing to the Lord and seeking to do that. So you see a strong emphasis here on the sanctified life. And then verse 11, uh, and do not, again, here's a negative uh, imperative. So you have may plus the imperative. So the, uh, the emphasis here of and do not be in communion with the fruitless works of darkness. This is very similar to what he said before about not um, getting together with the sons of darkness. Here we are not to be in communion with the works, um, with the, the fruitless works of what? Of darkness. So not only are we not to be in communion with people, who are sons of disobedience, but we are not to have this kind of uh, communion or union with the kind of fruitless works that characterize them. Uh, rather, we are to be doing those things which are, again, good and righteous and true, uh, the fruit of the light, not the fruit of uh, the works of, of darkness. Then, in ver uh, but rather, instead of uh, being in communion with them, Rather, he says here, Malone, we are to expose them. So we are to show them to be what we should not do. We are to expose them to be what they are as fruitless um, things that are in, in, uh, not pleasing to the Lord. 
Verse 12, for the things done in secret, and here this language emphasizes things done under the cover of darkness. So I, I put it in blue because it fits into that darkness-light contrast. The things happening, here's the participle, uh, under on darkness, he says, uh, are <clears throat> by them, here, Cupa, by them, namely by the sons of disobedience. And those works are, right here, um, are shameful. Um, right here, uh, in verse 12, are shameful uh, to the utmost, okay? Even to speak about. Namely, we don't even want to say anything about these these works that are done under the cover of darkness. And here, pagan idolatry, sexual immorality, Paul's talked about it a little earlier in Ephesians and the verses before it. And so it's important to see that that's what he's referring to, even though it's not in this context. He's mentioned it just in the verses, the earlier verses of chapter 5. Then he goes on and he says, um, verse 13, but... And then you have the panta, all the things. Uh, so here, all the things, and then the contrast, exposed by the light. So here, it's a, in contrast to those uh, fruits of darkness, we have all the things that are ex being exposed, participle, by the light, and then here you have uh, uh, an epiphany uh, word. Here's the verb. Um, they are, are made visible. They are made manifest. These things are things that, that are to be shown to the world. Um, they are, are the kinds of things we are to do in the day um, and, uh, and let the world see the, the, the good works of, of God being wrought in us. So, uh, and he goes on in verse, oh, and uh, in verse 14, and he, he goes on by saying, for everything made visible is light. And here again, you have that same uh, verb as the participle form here. We just saw it in verse 13 at the end. That it, uh, and here it is in uh, participle form. So verse 14, for everything made visible is light. And again, that, that emphasis of, of uh, the good works of God reflecting he who is the light of the world. And just as it says uh, right here, uh, end of verse 14, which uh, is a very, very interesting, uh, almost like a short hymn or a poem that reflects your baptism. Why do I say that? Listen to it. You have the imperative arise or get up. Uh, you see this kind of language in terms of resurrection or coming out of the baptismal water. Uh, and then it says the one who is sleeping, O sleeper, arise from the dead. Right here, that, that anastasis verb uh, we're so familiar with in terms of resurrection. So you have two verbs here related to uh, death and coming alive. So first of all, to rise and to, uh, and, and, or to get up and then to rise, to be uh, raised from the dead. Uh, from among the dead ones and you have then uh, epifusen, epifausen. You have there the, uh, the uh, verb epiphausai, uh, that Christ, right here is your, your subject, he will shine right here upon you. So the emphasis here is, I think, uh, a baptismal hymn or prayer talking about coming uh, alive, arising, and having Christ shine on us. And obviously, the emphasis here is Christ will shine in and through the life that we live as we live every day, drowning the old Adam, letting the new man, Christ, shine through our lives. 
Verse 15. Again, we'll scroll up a little bit right here, just so we get more of the text. So, verse 15, uh, Paul starts off, therefore, again, summarizing what he's just been saying, uh, and then the imperative, therefore, watch or look. And here, akrabos is an adverb meaning accurately or carefully. You can see the, the, uh, uh, the root word akrabos as the root for accurate in English. So, look or watch carefully or accurately how you walk. There we see that verb again of walking. And again, uh, the Christian life is a walking in the Lord. It's a walking in, uh, it's, it's talking about our sanctified life as a daily walk in, um, in love. And again, the contrast, not as unwise, you see the root is wise, but it has the negating alpha there, not as unwise ones, but as wise ones, uh, namely as ones who have been baptized and who are wise in the Lord, who listen to his voice and his word rather than to the, the siren calls of the world. And then verse 16, uh, redeeming, here you have this language of buying uh, the, the language of uh, purchasing, uh, you, you have um, this participle emphasizing redeeming the time. And Chiron here, uh, the understanding of, of uh, that now we, are, we have this divine time of grace. Uh, and uh, we have, uh, because we have been purchased, now this time is a time of grace, a time of mercy to, to be lived for God. So redeeming the time uh, and uh, using the time that we have while it is light before the darkness comes and judgment comes. That's certainly a theme that we see elsewhere in Paul. And then he says, for why? Because the days are evil. The days are evil ones. Uh, and uh, our time is limited, so we should use it wisely. Verse 17, sorry, the one dropped off there, verse 17, uh, Paul continues on, for this reason, for this reason, do not become foolish ones. So he's just cautioned you against being foolish up here in, in the verse 15, and he's called upon you to be wise ones. So again, same theme here, do not become foolish ones, but here the contrast, but understand what is the will of, of God. So here, you have the verb, it's an imperative form. Understand what is the thelma, the will of, of the Lord. And here again, think about the will of the Lord is not something that we just think about through our minds, but it's something God has revealed in his word. So just think about the close relationship between will of God and his revealed word. Where do we find the will of God? We find it in his revealed word. Uh, then uh, Paul goes on, verse 18, uh, here again, encouraging sanctification, and do not become drunk with wine. Here Paul is, you know, this Dionysus cult is one of the pagan cults, and certainly that engaged, there was debauchery, that followed becoming inebriated. So Paul is certainly cautioning against that kind of activity. Do not get drunk with wine, uh, which is debauchery. Uh, namely, that leads to other things. It leads to other sin. But I think about in our culture, how many problems happen because people have, have indulged too much. Sexual sins, um, abuse of spouses, uh, killing of, of people um, through drunk driving, all sorts of things result from that. Okay, but uh, Paul says in contrast to that, be filled up. So rather than filling your stomach with wine, too much wine, rather be filled up 
in the spirit. So the emphasis here is the contrast between overindulgence and being in Christ, in the spirit, living the sanctified life. Uh, and speaking, what's the kind of activity that Paul calls us to do? Look at the contrast. Rather than to be engaged in, in drunkenness, it's to be engaged in worship. And that's what we see in verses 19 and 20. The strong emphasis on being engaged in worship. Well, how, how is he emphasizing this? Speaking to uh, one another in Psalms. So using the biblical language to, to uh, offer praise and, and lament uh, to one another and especially to God. So with Psalms, with hymns here, and there's, so there's some kind of contrast going on in terms of the, the different kinds of things that are sung in, in the context of worship. Psalms, Old Testament. Uh, hymns, hymns that are written. Uh, and also spiritual songs right here. So uh, three different categories, but I think Paul is just using all three to emphasize What's to be on our lips is a regular part of our life is this worship, is, is psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, rather than the kind of activity that characterizes the sons of, of darkness. And, and uh, singing and psalming, here's the emphasis is singing and psalming. You see the relationship between these two Greek words. Here you have the participle, here we have the noun. Psalming in your heart. Uh, so this is what's to be in your, your, uh, your, uh, on your mind, in your hearts, these kinds of uh, words and these kinds of thoughts uh, to the Lord. So again, whenever you see curios, think of the fact that Paul uses that as a title for Christ. So um, you have the understanding of offering worship to Christ as the center uh, person who reveals the Holy Trinity. Verse 20, again, the worship language, giving thanks. We see the verb Eucharisto. Here's the participle form, giving thanks always on behalf of all. So very inclusive language in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to our God, to the God and Father. So here again is Paul's Trinitarian confession coming out, is the focus on Jesus as Lord and the Father as God uh, is really unpacking the Shema. Uh, Behold, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. And so um, any worship offered to the Son is also glorifying God who is Father. So the Trinitarian revelation is central to what Paul is saying there. And doing it in the name, why can we, should we do it in the name? Because we bear that name. That's a baptismal language. That name's been placed upon us in baptism. Everything we do grows out of then that life we live uh, because we have been baptized and we share the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And finally, he concludes here with the uh, hypotasso, uh, verb that's in the participle form here. Here's the participle. Um, being subordinate. Uh, it's uh, hypotasso is the language of submission or subordination. Being subordinate to one another, uh, namely to others in the Christian community, um, in fear of the Lord. So basically this language of submission is the foundation for the fact that we submit to one another because Christ is the Lord or head of the church. And that's the basis then for the structure in the Christian family. Wives submitting to husbands, children submitting to parents, um, uh, servants submitting to masters, etc. That we are to submit to one another is the emphasis that Christ is our common Lord. And so we serve one another as Christians. Again, uh, as we conclude, we can go back uh, away from the text, back to uh, just to wrap this up. Uh, you see Paul's language of sanctification, the contrast between those who are of the darkness and those who are of the light. 
and living as children of the light, walking in the ways of the Lord, contrast to the pagan life that these Christians have been called out of. And it's still a very important type of text for the church today. We live in a pagan world. We're surrounded by immorality and, and debauchery, and, and uh, we are called to walk as children of light, show forth that light. May the Lord bless your teaching, your proclamation of this text uh, in the church today.